Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. So um, I'm just going to go through quickly kind of what's been going on in the corn and soybean markets. Um, basically, as Give me one second. Uh, um, you know, the main factors that everyone can knows right now is it's harvest. So obviously that's having the biggest impact. But then when we look beyond just the harvest, where are we at? Um, primarily it's where we're looking at for exports. And then the secondary thing is whether or not um, it's ethanol and crush. Those are those are our big impacts right now as far as for market and what we're paying attention to. Let's just look quickly um, at soybeans. What's the situation? Um, just to give you an idea to remember from October 11th. So it's been a little while, you know, was the updated what was the report. Uh, this just kind of went over again. What's the supply use um, for the 24-25 marketing year? So that's the 24 harvest that we're in right now. Uh, when we look at it for soybeans, the biggest thing to take note of is that ending stocks down there. So given our large production um, where we're at and that we've had large productions actually for a couple of years now, um, our ending stocks is anticipated to be at 550 million bushels. So that is up 61% um, uh, from where we were at last year. That's a huge number. Um, and essentially, that's that's one of the things where any type of news that we get that even could be considered bullish is going to be impacted by that number right there because the market's just going to keep looking at it, that and saying, Wow, we just have a lot of beans. So that's that's one part that we really have to think about. Um, where we're going for production, you know, why is that number so high? You know, essentially, if you look at the last several years, so this is a million metric tons rather than basically in bushels. But, you know, the U.S., you know, we're, they're saying 124.7 million metric tons. Last year, we were at 113. Um, but if you went back a decade ago, well, I guess it's 11 years ago now, um, you know, we were at 91. So, you know, that plays into that. I mean, we've just been increasing basically production um, on this. Play, couple that then with Brazil, uh, USDA, Watt, their report, they estimate that Bra Brazil is going to have 169 million metric ton production this year. Uh, you know, they're a little high compared to basically when we look at South American analysts and that, but they're all still staying at like 166. So no matter way, no matter how you look at it, whether it's 166 or 169, it's still significantly up than what they were the previous year. So we just have large amounts of production, um, whether it's from the U.S. or from Brazil, that the world's just basically having to contend with for soybeans. When we look at it from the idea then where are we at for exports, you know, um, the gray line down there at the bottom is just basically where we're at for this year. So we've really just kind of started this marketing year. Um, you know, the forecasted exports by the USDA is that we're going to be up 9% over last year. Uh, but note that last year was down 21% from the previous year, three year average. So being up is, um, although that's good, it's, you know, what's the starting point? So we're still expected to be below what was the 21 to 23 export level. Big chunk of that is just basically Brazil has a lot of beans um, and they're cheaper. So, you know, that, that plays into the exports then for the US when we're looking at it from a worldwide perspective. Um, you know, Again, this just kind of shows you that production. If you went back a decade, where are we compared to Brazil? If you look at it, the Brazilian line is the basically the soybean production over the last decade and what they've gone, I mean, excuse me, for exports. Um, and then for the orange line is basically the US exports. We're staying about the same. It's just from a worldwide perspective, even though we're having more beans being used, the China and so forth are getting them primarily from Brazil. When we look, and so China plays into this a little, it's, they're still strong right now, but we have basically, um, a, and some of that plays in because Chinese economic stimulus is kind of helping keep some of those uh, soybean imports strong. They're down relative to where they are typically at this time of year. 
Um, and then where this becomes a little bit concerning for the net rest of this year is that if China is importing less soybeans and Brazil has as large of a harvest as we expect, then we're going to probably see an even stronger drop off towards by March on our soybean exports than what we would typically expect. So we really need the beginning part of the year to be really strong if we're going to have any chance of making the expectation by the USDA. Um, it's way too early in the marketing year to say whether or not there's going to be adjustments on that, but that is one thing to at least be paying attention to for throughout this, these next couple months, because for the most part with soybeans, even though we export all year, the majority of our exports of soybeans are done before March. So that really, these next few months for it really plays into, um, that demand side for us. When we're looking at crush, this is where we really can say, okay, this is a big thing for us and this is really helpful and impactful. We had record crush in 24. So last year's um, marketing year for soybeans was record crush size. And if you think about it, we're expected to be even higher for this year. And given the strong feed, given the strong processor demand, given the consistency that we've seen, even though there's been a few little bits here, blips here and there with crush, we will probably be, that's a pretty safe assumption that we're going to be there. So that is really helping keep soybeans from crashing further from the price being declining even further. All right. Uh, when we look at progress, um, as, as we pointed out here earlier, you know, we've had really dry weather. It's been really warm. It's been dry. So we are way ahead um, in harvest for both corn and soybeans than where we typically are. When we look at it for the U.S., uh, we're 81 percent completed for harvest um, as of Monday. Uh, you know, typically the year before that was 72 percent. And if you go back to that five year average, we're at 67 percent. So we're pretty far. We're we're more advanced in harvest than where we typically are. Uh, Wisconsin is an even bigger percentage because uh, we looked at, we're saying we're 93% complete for soybean harvest, 65% um, for 23, and then where we're typically at is 61% then basically for um, the five-year average. That plays into it from a market perspective because typically once we get complete from harvest, then typically the market feels a little bit of sense of about a week after that. After you see those big numbers, then you can start see, usually we see bases start to stabilize. And then we also see um, the, the situation from a national perspective, if we have really high harvested percentages done, that's when we start to see that the bottom of the markets occurred and we start to see those prices increase. And so I'm pretty much saying that, I think most people have agreed, some say some analysts are still thinking maybe we have a week yet, but um, I think a lot of them are agreeing, some, some are even saying, hey, we might've actually even hit the low of the market like two and a half weeks ago. So we're probably on that side, but it's not as if there's bullish news. It's just the fact that harvest is done and now we have to start going into a normal situation where prices increase over a period of time because we're using that demand. Let's look at, I mean, that's the pot. Let's look at uh, corn. Um, again, with the uh, October WASDA, uh, really there wasn't from September and so forth, there wasn't really any big changes. Again, when you look at the carryout, it, given if we actually have the production and the yields, uh, if the USDA doesn't make major changes to this, you know, we're still looking at a very strong carryout year over year. So increasing at that point, that's just going to keep playing on the market. Bullish side, though, for corn, we do have some really nice things. Um, we've had really strong exports uh, for the last a um, little bit. And if you looked actually even at this last week, we've had five consecutive days of corn sales, which sounds kind of like, oh, you've sold corn five days, but that's actually a pretty big indication. Um, and that's pretty good news. So we've had really strong exports at the start of this year. Um, so that's a really good sign that corn is, is moving. The other is that when we're looking at it from a world point, I just want to point this out, is that where does corn play into as far as for the world? Now, in the last decade, we've lost world share. Um, so if you went back a decade ago, we were 36% of the world market. Um, now, last we're expected to be about 31% of the world market this year. And note that the majority or most of that is being made up basically where we're looking at kind of that South American play. 
Why that makes a difference is if we look at what is Brazilian production for corn and soybeans. Um, so it was down last year. Um, and the expectations is that if they are having problems um, getting some of the serif, serif, I can never say that, their second crop corn in um, for Brazil, then that could mean that they're basically going to be even down further on corn production. So that's going to help from a U.S. perspective of keeping that corn market and, and those exports very strong for the U.S. corn. When we look at ethanol, um, it's basically where we're looking uh, for this WASDA is kind of indicating that we'll be down a little bit as far as for ethanol production. Um, if you look at the grain crushings report, it, these are all somewhat minimal, but um, you know, they're basically grain crushing report says that we had basically 5.378 billion bushels were crushed for ethanol. WASDA from it is there still estimates from last year was 5.3. 471. So there's a little discrepancy there. They'll make adjustments to that by the January report for that supply estimates. But what to note is that, you know, it's like kind of depending on which one are we going with the 25 marketing year, it's it's kind of in between the two. So we're really seeing corn for ethanol. It's not, it's, it's there. It's strong. That's a strong um, demand for it. It's just that it's not growing at this point. So we need to make sure that it keeps at least that strength and we don't lose that market. Um, when we look at the progress condition, again, where we were at for the week, uh, for the beginning of this week, um, if we're looking at 18, the 18 states that they survey, it's 65% uh, completed and harvested. We were at 55% in 2023 from a US national. Um, when we look at Wisconsin, uh, we are 44% or we were, excuse me, we are 44% complete at the beginning of this week. Um, but typically we're at about 21% um, and about the five year average was 23%. So we're way ahead of harvest of where we typically are in the year. Again, what does that mean from a market perspective? It, you know, once we get it in, basis tends to stabilize. Um, and then secondly, once you get it in, the market feels secure as far as for what is that yield? What is that production? What do we have? And now prices can tend to um, seasonally increase from there out. So that's typically about where we indicate what is the low of the season. So where are they going to go? Um, you know, again, it, we're pretty far along into the harvest, so I don't see yields that massive changes where they go, here's going to be yields. There will be adjustments every month between now and January, little bits here and there. Um, um, unless there's something that the market isn't grossly is, is not expecting, um, that probably won't make huge changes. The bigger thing would be South America if there's major issues um, on being able to get crops in or where we're sitting for the crops um, uh, in the South America and if that has an impact from a worldwide perspective. Mostly though, we should be following the seasonal pattern for both corn and soybeans, which is to basically increase from now until either March, April for soybeans, May, June for corn. What are factors that we want to consider? These are all just kind of the things that I've talked about. So bearish, you know, we're well ahead of average. We've got a record crop. All of these things have been built into it um, already into the price, but they're still there and their people are paying attention to them. From the bullish side, again, all this stuff has been built into the, the price already. But, you know, the fact that we have late planting of the Brazilian crops, the economic stimulus, all that's basically making it so that that's that bullish so it doesn't drop too low. When we're looking at the current trend, then basically for soybeans, um, we're sideways, mostly a little bit up, maybe. Um, and the reason why we can say that there's a little bit up has really not to do with any bullish or bearish fundamental news. It has to do more with technical side. So we have net commercials that have gone through and basically they from from the point of the net commercials, they offset a large percentage of their open short contracts. So they bought a lot um, and they actually bought more than what they were offset. So they basically have a net long position. So that's helping that increasing of that net long position um, has helped make it continue to go up. What that's saying is that for the most part, 
um, non-commercials and speculators think that the soybean price is a little underpriced. All right, so that's that's that idea. When we look at, um, uh, excuse me, sorry. When we look at the corn, same thing, bearish and bullish man. So this is, I talked about, it's all built into it. Um, where we look at um, some of these is that, and I, um, the supply to use metric, if we're just looking at basically um, the market likes to look at supply and use, that ratio there, if we're looking at that, that should be pricing corn at about 420 um, for an average year for the marketing year. So, um, and if you looked at soybeans, if you went back to that, sorry, I didn't point that out, we were looking at $10.50. So if you play in with, with what Paul was just talking about, um, now, granted, those were for prices, you know, for the crop that we're going to be planting, um, but it, we're going to have to see higher prices than where we're at right now. Um, these are all basically, we're not, this isn't looking great right now if you're trying to sell the old crop and cover the ver the cost then for next year's production. Um, when we're looking at it from the trend wise for corn, basically it's sideways. I don't really see a lot of even upward side from it, from the technicals um, of there, because we're not really increasing either net or long position. And in fact, actually a lot of commercials are getting out of the corn market. Um, and when they exit the corn market, that's basically them saying, hey, we think this price is accurate. We don't think it's either underpriced or overpriced. Um, and so they think it's a pretty consistent and accurate price for what it should be based off fundamentals. So that's kind of where we're sitting for those markets, um, what I think will happen. Soybeans, if you're looking at it, I, I'm not even going to talk about for 25 crop. I know Paul just went through some of the input costs on it, but I would say given these markets, for corn and soybeans, you shouldn't really even be looking at doing any pre-harvest hedging for the 25 crop until at least January. Uh, it's probably going to be later, but I wouldn't be doing anything at that at this point for those. Um, when we're looking at for this current crop that you're just taking um, out of the fields now or just taking out of them, it depends on what is your perspective. If you have done no hedging prior to this, um, and um, and if if you have storage, you should be looking at potentially there's some pot potential for storage opportunities. Um, if you have done any types of hedging, so if you have puts and or calls um, that are in place, if you have puts on soybeans, um, I would be looking to offset those at this point right now. Um, if you have unpriced soybeans, I'd be doing nothing on it. Um, and if you're storing, I'd be looking at going short in those March contracts. From corn, um, again, if you've bought puts, I'd be looking at offsetting those. If from a if from a hedging perspective, you had done a forward contract and sold calls, um, I would probably may, be maintaining those calls still at this point. I think there's still some potential there to gain a little bit more revenue before I'd be offsetting those. So those are kind of the ideas as far as for marketing. I'll do the same as for Paul. If you have questions, you can either email me or um, we could take some here at the in the last few minutes. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Botel.